Can you just talk about um, one of the things that you mentioned in your article is something that um, uh, uh, Dr. Radix mentioned in their talk, which is one out of three trans people have faced some sort of discrimination in the healthcare system and therefore are more reticent to seek care. Um, but that's a statistic. You wrote about the emotionality of it. Can you talk about the fear that um, you have had in the past that you think would impact on your seeking care in COVID-19 and other people, other trans people as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, in my article, I talked about passing, which, you know, I'm lucky enough to uh, go around my day-to-day -day life with, you know, people don't really know that I'm trans. And that's actually um, even included medical settings. And, you know, over time, I have noticed very distinctly that I'm treated really differently by nurses, by administrative staff, and by doctors if you know, maybe they don't know that I'm trans. And, you know, so I go in for a uh, an ingrown toenail and I'm like, you know what? This doctor probably doesn't really need to know that I'm transgender, you know, at the urgent care to treat my ingrown toenail. And, ah, lo and behold, I have a very, you know, normal, uh, you know, relatively painless, except that it's, you know, a painful thing, uh, you know, experience where I'm not being asked my pronouns uh, five different times by five different people. I'm not having people mistake, make a mistake and then apologize or over apologize. I'm not being asked probing questions about my personal life that I'm not really interested in and that aren't really relevant. Um, and I wrote the piece because, you know, COVID-19 um, is a much more serious illness. And if I was very seriously ill, who knows if I could even get away with, um, you know, not disclosing that I was transgender. And it would be quite dangerous to go into an emergency situation and not give the doctors all of the relevant information. But as someone who has experienced discrimination, who, you know, my primary care doctor I go to because the guy will prescribe hormones and it's the only person within three hours who will prescribe um, hormones for me, you know, but he'll do it and he'll be like, oh, hey, yeah, what's, what's your cup size? Like, you know, like objectifying my body in this really gross and frightening and dehumanizing way and treating me much more like a specimen or an interesting case than just, you know, a human being. And so because of these experiences, I have a lot of fear that anytime I'm interacting with medical professions, they're not going to be seeing me as you know, as worthy, as valid as their other patients. And so even in a very extreme situation, my fear that I'm just going to be a little bit less valid, I'm just going to be a little bit less, um, you know, worthy or important, or my life is less uh, worth saving, you know, maybe I'm going to take that risk and try to make, have them maybe not know that I'm transgender because it is really terrifying that my care isn't going to be you know, as good as someone who they think is more valid. Right. Um, this um, this particular issue um, is taking place against the backdrop. So we know that trans people have this fear and this reticence because of the very real discrimination that people have faced, and you detail that um, in some ways that are really stomach turning. And as a human being, I'm so sorry that you have to experience that and have experienced those just to be able to get the healthcare that you need uh, to be a human being. But of course, um, all of this is taking place against the backdrop, which you also write in your article about the move by the Trump administration to deny equal access to, um, to trans people, to healthcare. And so what would be the role, do you think, of passing this discriminatory rule in adding to this overall atmosphere of fear and discrimination that people are facing? Yeah, the Trump administration wants the law to say, you know, not just uh, trans people are un invisible and don't matter, um, you know, that we're not going to protect them. They want to go a step further and say, um, you know, you can discriminate, like you have a right to discriminate against a transgender patient. And, you know, that's frankly, like terrifying. I think that, um, you know, doctors, people take their, um, you know, take messages, they, they take 
the the climate of the administration and it impacts how they treat people um you know this uh the desired law would go well beyond um you know saying that someone can't discriminate if they don't want to prescribe hormones which obviously that is needed care, just like Tati said. I mean, I'm not saying that that should be treated differently, but you know, I think a lot of cisgender people don't realize that what they want is for doctors to have a right to refuse any kind of medical care, however basic, however life-saving, just because they want to discriminate. They want to protect a right to discriminate against us. And um, yeah, in that environment, how can you not consider maybe it's better they don't know? Right. And also this separate move by this um, 20 states across the country to, to allow people to deny um, access to equal access to trans teens, specifically uh, prescribing hormones after they've gone through a process of evaluation, is also contributing to this as a backdrop. And I think you've spoken about the fact that you, as a foster parent to trans teens, this is among your worst nightmares. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm not a scholar on the law, but as I understand it, um, you know, they want to to criminalize people who help teens get uh, trans affirming medical, medically necessary care. And so, you know, in my actual life, I take in kids who are being neglected or abused or mistreated by their parents, sometimes because of their gender identity. So, you know, they come from a home where they're not affirmed and they come into a safe place. And now the law wants to mess with my ability as a foster parent to affirm this child, to get them the medical treatment that they need and want, and, you know, to give them a different environment from, you know, their home environment where they've been, you know, unable to thrive, when they've been maybe treated really badly or maybe just, you know, um, couldn't get access to what they need. Right. Um, and lastly, what do you think from our entire experience with COVID-19 would be some important takeaways um, as important building blocks for improving healthcare for trans people? What are the, some of the things that we need to learn? So um, I think that, you know, I have two different kind of messages for cisgender people um, and for transgender people. I think cisgender people really need to learn that this is life or death, that it's real. Um, I often say every single, you know, piece of journalism I do about being trans is just really reiterating over and over again, I'm a real human being. And <laughs> it's like, it gets tiring to just say that every time, but like, we have very modest needs to be able to be treated equally in society, and we are, do not have that now. And just hammering it into cis people every which way that this is, you know, real medical care that is necessary, that goes beyond whatever, um, you know, fantastic thing they think is going on about genitals or whatever. And then what trans people need to do is we need to network with each other to find out who the affirming providers are and to make sure that um, that people can figure out where to go, uh, how to get what they need. Planned Parenthood in particular is often the best um, resource for a rural area like mine. So, you know, look into that and, you know, um, make it easier for us to to figure out where to go and how to get medical care without discrimination, while also, of course, pushing as activists to improve the picture everywhere. Right, right. Thank you so much for that. One of uh, our audience me members, Cora Webb, is <clears throat> asked how to necessarily go about spotting people who um, and providers who are, are who are affirming and trans health. I mean, one, we put up some of those resources in our timeline so that you can be able to identify that. But I think quite clearly early signs of whether or not they are objectifying your body as you've experienced or, you know, whether or not they're using the right pronouns. I think the other thing is that so many of this is, is about basic respect, right? You're training people to be respectful in so many ways. Um, but I wanted to thank you for coming on. Um, your article, If I Get Sick With COVID-19, Do Not Tell My Doctor That I Am Transgender, um, is an article that people should check out. Um, and we've linked to it in our timeline. Thank you so much for joining us and all the best to you as we move through this incredibly difficult moment. And thank you for sharing these incredibly personal stories and, and feelings. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Amara. Great show.